Did the Romans know how to harness nanotechnology? The Romans were masters of engineering, from aqueducts to self-healing concrete, from their roads and siege weapons, and not to mention their monumental architecture like the Pantheon's dome and the Colosseum's ability to host naval battles. The remnants of these massive feats of engineering and technology can be found all throughout Europe, Asia, and Africa. But it also now seems that the Romans were pioneers in nanotechnology, a field that wouldn't emerge until the 1980s. Today, we're investigating the infamous color-changing Lycurgus Cup, and I've enlisted Dr. David Miano from the World of Antiquity YouTube channel to help. Let's get into it. The Lycurgus Cup is an outstanding, rare example of a complete Roman cage cup, or diatretum. Cage cups are vessels of glass that have a design painstakingly cut into and carved down from the surface to leave a decorative, quote, cage around it, and you get these designs that stand out quite distinctively. Many times, parts of the cage are completely undercut, which is just astounding craftsmanship when you look at it. Cage cups have been called one of the most technically sophisticated glass objects to be produced before the modern era. There are only about 50 to 100 surviving examples of cage cups, and they've been found across the Roman Empire, generally dating to the 3rd and 4th century CE. The majority of cage cups are geometric or abstract in design, but the Lycurgus cup is unique because this is a figural carving that tells a story. It's an exceptional piece of late Roman workmanship and is the only well-preserved figural example of these cage cups. On this cup, the ancient Greek myth of King Lycurgus unfolds. Lycurgus was a king of the Thracian Edoni tribe, and there are many different versions of the story, but in one of them he tries to kill, or does indeed kill, the nymph Ambrosia, who just happens to be a follower, or again is sometimes a caregiver, of the god Dionysus. As she died, she called out to Mother Earth and was transformed into a vine and twisted and coiled around Lycurgus sometimes suffocating him until he died. Again, or in other versions, sometimes holding him captive until Dionysus could come and dole out punishment. There are a bunch of other stories that have different sequences of events, like I mentioned, but we can see this vine imagery beautifully carved onto the cup. Looking at the front of this cup, we can see the branches of the vines entrapping a very naked, but still wearing his boots, Lycurgus, and then just off to the left, crouching, is a much smaller Ambrosia. Behind Ambrosia is one of Dionysus's satyrs in human form, getting ready to hurl a rock at Lycurgus. On the right side of Lycurgus is the god Pan with a panther at his feet. The snout is missing, but you can kind of get the, the idea of what it would look like. And then at the back, we have Dionysus himself, the god of good times and wine, taunting Lycurgus and reveling in his defeat. It's this beautiful, though perhaps morbid, depiction of divine justice, and themes like this often show up on ancient Greek and Roman drinking vessels. This particular scene, though, is not a very common reference in ancient art, which makes the cup all the more special, and potentially mysterious. It's been suggested that this scene of Dionysus's triumph over Lycurgus was actually chosen as a commentary of a political event that happened around the time the cup was made, the defeat of Emperor Licinius by his co-emperor Constantine I in 324 CE after being held captive under close guard for a period of time. It's thought that the cup was made for use during Bacchic rituals. Dionysus is called Bacchus in ancient Rome because, you know, the whole thing with the the ancient Romans, taking all the Greek gods and just renaming them. That's what happened here. And these Bacchic celebrations and rituals were still very much a feature in Roman religious life around the time that caged cups were popular. As you can see, the cup has a gilt silver foot and rim, 
These are later additions to the cup and it originally wouldn't have had a base like this. This strange like lack of a base is something found on other cage cups and it may mean that cups like these were made to be passed around. Cage cups we know were also suspended and used as very fancy oil lamps to show the magic of the glass and these amazingly undercut and fragile circular decorations. Imagery, technical design, and execution aside, there's one other thing that makes the Lycurgus cup even more extraordinary. The glass and the optical effects it produces when you shine light on it. The glass the Lycurgus cup is made of is dichroic, meaning that it exhibits different colors at different angles or under different conditions. In direct light, the cup looks like it might be made out of jade with this lovely semi-opaque green yellow color. But when light shines through the glass, what we call transmitted light, it becomes this amazingly vibrant and translucent ruby color. It's been suggested that this color change from green to red could have been to evoke the imagery of the ripening of red grapes which would add even more meaning to the Dionysus symbolism on the cup. The earliest evidence we have for the Lycurgus cup is in 1845, when a French writer said that he had seen it some years ago in the hands of a Monsieur Dubois. It's thought to have been bought by the Rothschild family shortly afterwards, and we know that they owned it at least by 1857 because German art historian Gustav Friedrich Wagen saw it in Lionel de Rothschild's collection, and he described it as, quote, barbaric and debased. Clearly, Wagen would not have enjoyed any of these Bacchic rituals. Any other further information about the cup, unfortunately, has been lost to time. We don't know who made it, when it was found, or even where. Archaeologically speaking, we probably don't know any of this because there's the very real possibility that the cup was never buried or even discarded. Because the cup is in such great condition and was most definitely a luxury object, it was likely sequestered away by a rich family or other secure environment like a church treasury. This is what happened to a lot of other valuable Roman objects. Other cage cups have been found in sarcophagi, so this is another potential find location for the Lycurgus cup. It's been speculated that the cup itself could have been made either in Alexandria, Egypt, or in Rome, or somewhere around Italy, around 290 to 325 CE, with the gilt rim and foot of vine leaves added around 1800. One theory is that this could have been one of the many objects that were taken and plundered from church treasuries during the French Revolution and the French Revolutionary Wars. After the 1850s, the cup next shows up almost 100 years later when it was finally examined at the request of Lord Rothschild and published in 1959. In the meantime, it was sold to the British Museum by Lord Rothschild in 1958 for £20,000. This is when real investigative work on the glass began. Because of the cup's unusual color and optical color switching abilities, early researchers thought that it was impossible that the cup would have been made of glass or that the Romans would have had the technical knowledge to produce such an effect. But of course, after looking at it under X-ray diffraction in 1959, it was confirmed that the cup was indeed made of glass. Glass making dates back to as early as 3,600 years ago in Mesopotamia, but Roman glass production really took off during the first century CE when new techniques like glass blowing emerged. The industry grew and grew until glass went from an uncommon, often thick, opaque, and very strong material to a faster to make, commonly available, albeit thinner, weaker, and colorless one. The Romans were now able to make glass cheaply and at a massive scale. But the Lycurgus cup was not this mass-produced piece of glass. It's one of the few surviving examples we have of dichroic color-changing glass. In fact, even other Roman dichroic glass examples don't even come close to replicating the effects presented by the Lycurgus cup. Lately, the major statement that has been circulating about the cup is that the Romans may have known about nanotechnology in order to create a color-changing material like this. But what's the real story behind the glass? 
Over to Dave Miano from World of Antiquity to break it down. Two questions matter here. What's physically happening inside this glass? And how much of that did Roman glassmakers intend? Let's take them in that order. The cup is a normal soda-lime silicate glass that happens to contain a tiny amount of precious metal. About 40 parts per million of gold and roughly 300 parts per million of silver. In the melt, those metals grouped into nanoparticles, little alloy specks of silver and gold with a hint of copper, about 50 to 70 nanometers across. That's smaller than most viruses. Those specks are frozen in place throughout the glass. Light hits those metal specks and sets the electrons on their surface moving in sync, like a wave rippling around a stadium. That collective wiggle, called a surface plasmon, means the particles interact with different colors of light in different ways. When you shine light on the cup's surface, reflected light, the particles throw back more of the greenish part of the spectrum, so the cup looks green. When you shine light through it, maybe transmitted or through backlight, the greens get preferentially scattered and the reds come through, so the cup glows ruby red. How do we know this is actually happening? In the 1850s, Michael Faraday showed that finely divided gold can make red colors in glass-like suspensions. The Lycurgus cup itself first entered the lab a century later. In the early 1960s, tiny fragments removed during conservation were chemically analyzed, confirming traces of silver and gold in a soda-lime glass. The decisive step came in 1990 with transmission electron microscopy, or TEM, a superpowered microscope that uses an electron beam to see features far smaller than light microscopes can. TEM images showed silver-gold alloy nanoparticles about 50 to 70 nanometers across embedded throughout the glass. That's the engine of the color flip. More recently, teams have checked the physics by taking calibrated photos of the real cup in reflection and in transmission and running computer models to ask what particle sizes, metal ratios, and glass properties would recreate exactly those colors. What they found is that particles in the tens of nanometers, a silver to gold ratio around two to one inside the particles, a relatively high index host glass, and a small copper contribution explain the purplish red seen in transmission. Roman glassmakers didn't know about electrons or plasmons. What they did have was recipe knowledge and process control. They chose sands, fused them with natron, and crucially, managed heat and furnace atmosphere so that metal additives would strike into color during reheating and cooling. If you repeatedly work that process with gold and silver bearing glass, you sometimes can achieve the color flip effect. So was the effect intentional? The ingredients and the workflow were intentional. The exact nanostructure that makes the magic was an emergent outcome of that craft. In short, intentional process, emergent nanostructure, refined by experience once they saw the result. The Lycurgus cup and other cage cups are just a small fraction of a long-lived, large-scale industry of glass production in ancient Rome. In the first century CE, people were falling in love with this new medium and experimenting. They were pushing glass making to the limits to see how far they could take this craft. As Dave said, the lack of complete technical and scientific understanding doesn't make the technique or handiwork any less skillful or magnificent. The Lycurgus cup was made of a very special glass and was worked on by a master of their craft over countless hours. Unlike the majority of glass vessels that were being made in the 4th century CE, the cup stands out as a testament to the innovation and experimentation the Romans did to perfect their glassmaking. The Lycurgus cup must have been a highly coveted object and used for a special purpose. How coveted and special, you ask? Well, we have references in ancient literature that might describe either the Lycurgus cup itself or something quite similar. In a biography of someone named Julius Saturninus, the author Vopiscus, who wrote in the early 4th century CE, talks about a letter that was supposedly written by the Emperor Hadrian to his brother-in-law Severianus in Rome. It states, I have sent you particolored cups that change color presented to me by the priest of a temple. They are specially dedicated to you and my sister. 
I would like you to use them at banquets on feast days. In this letter, we have clear evidence that color-changing cage cups were being made in the early 4th century CE, and that they were so coveted that they were deemed a worthy gift of an emperor to his family, and that they would have been reserved for special occasions. The Lycurgus cup is even more unique because using gold and silver to color glass was not an exact science for the Romans, and it did seem to be a bit of a hit and miss affair. There are so many factors you need to take into account when making it, such as the concentration of the metals, their distribution, and the temperature of the glass. We aren't sure how the Romans discovered how to make gold ruby, this distinct red color of the Lycurgus glass, but we do know that it was a challenging task even for the most skilled glassmaker. It also seems to have been quite a restricted skill, because this technique doesn't survive past the 4th century. There are some medieval Islamic writings that do mention the production of glass using gold, but no examples have yet to be found. The production of gold ruby in Europe doesn't then appear again as routine practice until the 17th century. This means the Lycurgus cup isn't just a symbol of outstanding Roman artistry. It's a rare example of a short-lived ancient Roman technology where precious metals or metal oxides were added to glass to make magical, color-changing objects that continue to fill onlookers with awe and wonderment, even though we now understand the science behind it. Here's what I love about the Lycurgus cup. It proves that understanding and wonder can sit side by side. With modern tools, we can talk about nanoparticles and plasmons and model the colors down to the nanometer. That's a real insight. But it would be a mistake to turn that into a story where the Romans were doing nanotechnology the way we mean it today. They weren't. Their achievement lives in their world. A world of furnaces and timing and the courage to try something no one else was making. When we project our categories backward, we risk flattening their success into our vocabulary. Better, I think, to let two truths stand together. The Romans mastered a process they understood on their own terms, and we can now explain the light they captured on ours. That's the promise of artifacts. They bridge ways of knowing. You know, craft and science, intuition and analysis, and they invite us to read the past without rewriting it. Thanks so much for watching, everybody, and big thank you to Dave Miano from the World of Antiquity YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe to him. If you like that video, you know what to do. Smash the like button, smash the subscribe button. Stay dirty, my friends.